Um, now, I guess it's time to move on to uh, Samuel uh, Hallam, who is going to be talking about uh, modeling carbonaceous chondrite survival, a potential resource cache on the lunar surface. Um, and uh, co-authors are Crawford, Collins, Joy, uh, Davison, and, um, uh, and, and, and Davidson. Brilliant, thank you. Right, is a uh, where is, is that is that sharing properly? Yes, just fine. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to be discussing today a little bit on uh, part of my PhD project that I've been working on, um, looking at the survival of carbonaceous chondrites after they impact into the lunar surface. Um, so, firstly, why do we care if they survive? Um, so the the main reason is looking at what is lacking on the lunar surface for the next phase um, and beyond of, of lunar crude missions. Um, so looking at lunar geology here, we've got a couple of maps of the, of the lunar surface um, showing that they're rich in things like iron, titanium, uh, silica, oxygen, things that we know in, in, in the minerals like ilmenite, um, as well as things like aluminium and calcium on, on the far side of the moon. Um, we've also heard a lot of things about how the Polar regions are very rich in volatile material, um, including uh, water that we're obviously very interested in in the terms of crude missions. Um, and these are usually found in concentrations around PSRs or inside PSRs. Um, and so we're also thinking now about what could be done beyond this. Um, so one thing that we're looking at is carbon on the moon. Carbon, a very useful resource for, for crude missions. Uh, also Cannon, some work by Cannon this year, um, showing the total carbon abundance versus the concentration for the inner solar system resources. So this is kind of concentrating on the moon and, and Mars um, and looking at where carbon can be found on the lunar surface. And to be honest, it, it's a small amount um, and it's spread across the lunar surface. So the, these resources of carbon aren't very great from, from a, a resource point of view. They're, they're not very um, concentrated. And so if there was a crude mission, it'd be very hard to use all of it very well because it's so widespread. So I'd like to add one to this list, possibly carbonaceous chondrites because of the significant lack of high concentration and accessible caches of both carbon and also we're thinking about nitrogen native to the lunar surface. And carbonaceous chondrites have a few properties that we're really interested in, but the, the main one that I wanna talk about is their high carbon nitrogen content. Um, this is both organic and inorganic, and uh, it can be up to six, even more weight percent in some samples that we see. Um, six weight percent and 0.5 weight percent for nitrogen. So this, this highly rich uh, organic material in these carbonaceous chondrites uh, could be a really good resource if they land in a way that's favorable to their survival and concentrates them in a small area. So an example of a, of, of a quite rich organic uh, sample is, is Murchison, a CM2, and it has organic matter in it with almost a two weight percent in some cases, and also some even hardier carbon materials like diamond, graphite, and silicon carbide. These are in much lower abundances, but they're much better at surviving high pressures and temperatures. So they're very interesting in terms of a resource point of view after an impact. Also, there's some amino acids that I'm looking at, uh, including glutamine, which has a, a pretty good vaporization temperature. It's in here, 850 Kelvin. So we're looking if the things can survive um, these temperatures and pressures after impacting the moon. So the resource potential, we're looking at two things. Are the pressure and temperature regimes suitable post-impact? And where does the projectile material end up? And so I've been using hydrocode modeling, specifically iSail 3D. To, to look at this and creating these scenarios with a, a carbonaceous chondrite-like parent asteroid impacting a basalt uh, lunar-like surface at these varying impact velocities and varying impact angles. Um, and this is a 3D code that allows us to look at uh, materials traveling through a mesh that has cells that are uh, filled by this material. Um, and then also in the projectile, we've put tracers that can track um, the pressures and temperatures as well as other um, parameters across the 
the, the scenarios that we run. So this is what it looks like from a cross section. This is an impact from right to left at a 45 degree angle. You can see the projectile material in black impacting into the uh, yellow target material there. So just as an example of a cross section of this 3D model. So some general thresholds that I was looking at um, include the melt temperature of the projectile, looking at what melts and what doesn't. It's a really good way to see how things might stay in place after they've impacted. Something that's melted or vaporized is more likely to escape and move around after impact. So we're looking at what's not melted and then some other temperatures for carbonates and amino acids and other things that are likely to survive. So some results for that, um, looking at the different impact scenarios we've got, um, this is a table showing the percentage of the, of the projectile material that survives and remains solid uh, according to the peak temperatures reached within the projectile. So it's 100% for the uh, lowest impact angle and uh, the uh, velocity, and it goes down to 0% for anything over 30 degrees and over 10 kilometers per second. Now, if we look at this from um, a resource perspective, as I talked about before, we want to look at the concentration of the mass surviving. And so this is what we'll look at here in these top down views of the of the remnant projectiles that remain. So this black material here uh, represents all material that remains between 1000 and 2000 Kelvin. So all of this hasn't melted. And you can see that a lot of this, the majority of the mass remains within this red dashed outline. So this is the top down looking at the crater. Um, and so this is less than 2.5 kilometers. Thanks. Uh, this is less than 2.5 kilometers in diameter. Um, it's highly concentrated. Uh, all of the material is less than 10 kilometers from the impact zone, uh, but no material survives uh, less than 1,000 Kelvin in their peak temperature. So no nitrogen is likely to survive here. It's all pretty much vaporized and been lost into the, the wider area. However, if we look at something like the highly um, oblique impact at 15 degrees from the, from the uh, horizontal and five kilometers per second, the lowest uh, the impact velocity that we tested, we have 30% of the projectile uh, that reaches temperatures of only 750 Kelvin at a maximum. Uh, and this is widespread, but it's actually concentrated downrange in a process called projectile decapitation, where um, a large mass of the projectile splits off from the impacting zone and travels further down range and impacts at a slower velocity and hopefully concentrates as we see here, slightly downrange. Uh, talking about the accessibility, just kind of building on this, most of the material is in one place in these highly oblique, uh, in these, um, sorry, more uh, vertical impacts, so this 60 degrees. But the simple lunar crater may have steep walls and a lack of a flat floor that may not help in the accessibility factor of this material. But there probably is a lot of carbon that survives in one place here. If we're wanting to look at um, material that survives at lower temperatures, so with more carbon species and with the potential for amino acids to survive with their nitrogen. Most of that material is going to be spread over a wide, wide area, but some of it in this decapitated portion of the projectile could be concentrated downrange and be a potential resource if it's concentrated like this. So these are two kind of the extreme end members that I looked at, and there is a whole range of different survivability within this, uh, which I obviously don't have time to show here, but there is survivability in a lot of other um, of the impacts as well. So just to finish off with some conclusions, I'll leave them up there, but the, the main thing is that we do see survivability of some carbon species and a good amount of concentration in smaller-ish areas that allow for um, their potential use as a resource in future. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Um, I think we have time for one question, so I can read out uh, 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 Shwaili's Question: Is it possible the vaporized materials will be uh, will condense back to the lunar surface? And if so, any estimate about the portion of materials coming back to the moon? That's a really good question, and it's something we've considered. These are definitely conservative estimates that I've got up here of the amount of surviving temp um, high temperature material. Uh, we just wanted to look at what remains solid, and it's easiest to say definitely stays in one place. But yes, it is definitely possible that some material could recondense. Um, uh, as for a proportion, I couldn't say anything on it yet, but there is more work to be done on this to look at that, yes. All right, well, thank you. I